I, I want to open it up by making maybe kind of a disclaimer at the very beginning of this. Uh, this is not intended to be a biblical study on every door that you find in the Bible. It's not what this is intended to be at all. There are many doors that we can, be, that we can study, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart when we went to St. Lucia. Uh, Brother Philbert and I were talking one day on the phone, and I said, uh, uh, this might be a good idea for a theme for the meeting. And uh, I talked about an effectual door that had been opened uh, with the ministry of Christ for the Caribbean. And when I told him the Bible verse, he said, yeah, that, he said, that just that spoke to me right then. He said, that's exactly the direction we want to go in. As a result of that, God started opening up my heart and my mind about some doors that I knew about in the Bible. And so what we're going to be looking at is four doors of opportunity. Uh, God does everything God does decently and in order. <clears throat> I'll, give you an ex I'll give you a real simple example. You have to go through the front door of your house before you can go through the bedroom door at your house. Now, there's an order to that. Right? If you don't go through the front door, you don't get to the bedroom door or the kitchen door or the bathroom door, whatever it might be. You have to go through that door first. So the very first door that I want us to look at is the door of salvation. Now, let me say this. If, you, if you're looking in, in, your, in your notes there, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and verse 7, the Bible says this. Now, under the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. There are times when God opens a door for us, and he wants us to go through that door. Sometimes that's an unexpected door. And as, I, as you've already heard me say before, the, I had an unexpected door to come to Kentucky. I wasn't looking for that, didn't expect that, it had never even crossed my mind. I really believed that I would spend the rest of my days pastoring Gatewood Baptist Church in Providence, North Carolina. Uh, the, the set of circumstances that brought me back to my hometown, which was Danville, Virginia, and it's literally like the difference between Florence and Burlington, that's the difference between Providence, North Carolina and Danville. I mean, it's right there on the border. They're right close to each other. And I thought that's where I was going to spend the rest of my life. But God had opened another door. And if God opens a door, God opened it for a reason. Right, right, right. He wants you to go through that door. Yeah. And you'll find out that when you go through that door, there'll be another door. Sure. There'll be something else that will open up as a result of that. But you're not going to see that other door open up until you go through the door God just told you to go through. Now, unless you go through the door of salvation, yes. these other doors don't mean anything at all to you. Right, right. That has to be the very first one. So God, he, uh, God shuts doors, God opens doors. If God shuts a door, he doesn't want you to knock it down. Right. That's right. He don't want you to try to push it through. If he shuts it, he shuts it for a reason. He stopped you from going in that direction of doing that. And it's not, I'm not even going to tell you, and we'll, we'll look at it in Scripture, that there's sometimes that God shuts a door on something and, and you kind of look at what you thought was going to be on the other side of that door and you really thought it was going to be a good thing. But God shut the door. Right. We'd be very well served to find out what God wants us to do and the plan that God has for us and follow that plan. And God does that in our lives by opening and shutting doors. Right. Uh, I've, I've seen that throughout all my Christian life, to be honest. He would open this door and that door and, 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 and things that made no sense to me whatsoever. I'd only been saved a few weeks. There were some things that happened very rapidly when I first got saved. Uh, I got saved on November the 1st, 1981. Two weeks later, I went out on a date with Nancy Matherly 
two weeks later, I asked her to marry me. Must have worked. Because here we are 41 years later. All right? In the process of all of that, been saved just a few weeks now, I'm going to a, a, a Bible study in a, in a home, a group from the church that they would get together during the week and they would, they would study. And I went to that. And one of those nights that we were there, the, the group said, we want you to teach next week. Now, I don't know if they wanted me to teach them how to play drums or, or work on a car. I don't know what they want. But I, I haven't been saved for two weeks, two or three weeks. They said, we want you to teach. And what God was doing, he was opening a door. Because in going through that door, there were other doors after that. And those doors led me to Florence, Kentucky. Now, I didn't know that at the time. But that's, that's what happened. Okay? So you have to understand that when God opens that door, He wants you to go through it. But if God shuts the door, He's going to open another one, but this one's closed to you now. Yeah. And yet you just have to leave that behind. Now, what the Bible tells us in Revelation 3, 7 and 8, is that when God opens a door, no man can shut it. Yeah. Now we're going to look at something else in the course of this study that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. If God opens a door for you, He wants you to go through it but that doesn't mean you will. Mm, yeah. Now, he wants you to or he wouldn't have opened it. Right. When the Bible says that God opens a door and no man can shut it, no man can shut it, right. but that doesn't mean you'll walk through it. Right. It's, a, it's open. It's available to you. Right. But when God opens it, he wants you to go through. And the key to that, quite frankly, is obedience. Amen. To do what it is that God want you to do. So, God's in control of the opening and the closing of the door. You're not. God's in control. God does not open a door because he does not want you to go through it. He opens it so you can have access to what's on the other side. It's not a tease or intended uh, even as a test. It's a divinely appointed opportunity. Now, here's something I think is a very important thing to realize. I believe until you've gone through the door of salvation, there really is no opportunity. Right. Yes, sir. Now, I didn't say you didn't have a career opportunity, right. a money-making opportunity, but I'm talking about an opportunity that has eternal spiritual value to it. You don't have that opportunity until you first go through the door of salvation. Right? then you can do something for God. Yeah. There's a lot of people think they're doing something for God, and they're not doing anything for God. Right. They're doing it for themselves. They're doing it for the show. They're doing it for whatever it might be. But if you'll go through the door of salvation, God will open up another door, and I'll show you some of those doors. But we have to get this thing in the right order. Right, All right now, I'm going to throw out one of these words. You ready? We are not predestinarians. Now, don't be impressed. All right? But we're not predestinarians. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, if you think because God opens the door, that means I'm automatically going to go through it, you're a predestinarian. God didn't create, create us this way. God created us to make a choice. Yeah. Matter of fact, our whole life path in this world is based on the choices we make. Right. And when he opens the door, the choice he wants you to make is to go through that door but we're not a puppet on a string. Right. God, open, God gives us opportunity. Would you take advantage of the opportunity? Mm. I ask you a question. How many of you, the very first time you ever heard the gospel, you got saved? Raise your hand. It's amazing to me how few hands I've seen in, in my lifetime that ever wrote on that question. Yeah, but you had the opportunity. Right. Right. I mean, you, you heard the truth. Yeah. It was presented to you. Yeah. And you, do you think God was holding back on you or something? No. No. But you had to make a choice. You have to take advantage of the opportunity. 
And the opportunity, the greatest opportunity, the very beginning of the race, so to speak, is the door of salvation. Uh, if God shuts the door, then you or I do not have the power or ability to go through it. But if God opens the door, we can refuse to go through it. Lord, what would you have me to do? That was a question asked in the Bible. What would you have me to do? Well, God opens the door. God opened the door to Isaiah. And said, this is what I want you to do. This is the direction. Go, walk in this way. And he had to make a choice to do that. Right. You had to make a choice to come here tonight. Right. Yes, sir. I'm glad you made that choice. Yeah. I think it was the right one. Yeah. It's, going to be, it's going to be difficult to get what God wanted you to get if you stayed home. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. Something, just something tonight. Something simple could be said tonight. Just make all the difference. <clears throat> I made this statement this past week. Uh, I want you to know what, a, what, a, what I believe is a blessed opportunity that you have by coming to Emmanuel Baptist Church in Florence, Kentucky and having Pastor Doug Foster as your pastor. I'm going to tell you what, what I, 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 I've exa examined this and observed this since I've been here. I believe that every time there is a service held here, our pastor expects something life-changing to happen every time we have a service. Yes, sir. Amen. I want you to know something about that. That's not everywhere. That's not even most places. But the fact that there was an open door of opportunity to come tonight, something could be said, something could happen here tonight, change your life forever. Yeah. You have to go through the door. You have to go through the door. Uh, I sincerely believe that God opened a door in the Caribbean Islands. Uh, an, an, ama an amazing thing. And uh, when the pastor announced a while ago about the, about the Bible college and all, can I just, can I let y'all in on a secret? Don't tell nobody. That scares me to death. scares me to death. But I found out that when God opens the door, if you'll go through it, God will equip you to do what he wanted you to do. Uh, when, I, when I was a principal of a Christian school, I told the pastor of the church uh, that they needed a principal. And I found myself in church service one night raising my hand, saying, Pastor, if you, if you can use me, I'll do it. And I'm looking at my hand and wondering, am I the one who just said that? Being a principal of a Christian school, by the way, is job security because nobody else wants that job. <laughs> and I told him, I said, this is the be this, as far as I know, this is the greatest qualification I have of being the principal of this school. I spent a lot of time in the principal's office when I was in school. <laughs> so I kind of know how it operates. <laughs> and I, I, I'm saying that as a joke, but I'm telling you the truth. But God opened a door, and God said, if you'll go through this door, I'll give you what you need to be able to do what needs to be done. It's the same way with the ministry of Christ for the Caribbean. It's the same way with, uh, uh, with, with the college. It's the same way with all of this. If you'll just let God work in you as you go through that door, you'll find out that on the other side, there'll be some wonderful things to the glory of God wonderful things to the glory of God uh, now the Bible also tells us this uh, the verse that we use is the, is the theme verse in, in 1 Corinthians talked about that uh, uh, there, was a, there was an open door and effectual a door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries did you know that God already knows that there are those who do not want you to walk through the door. Yeah. He knew that when he opened it. Right. Right. And he'll, he knows that when you walk, through, there'll be those who try to keep you from going through the door, and then once you've gone through the door, there will be those who will try to keep you ineffective after you've gone through the door. There are adversaries. Yeah. 
And adversaries can come from all kinds of directions. But God already knows that. And he called you anyway. And he opened the door anyway. He said, come on through. Come on this side. I have something for you. And you'll be able to do what I want you to do. So he opens the door. All right. Uh, in, if you take your, uh, look in your Bible, in John chapter 10, we're going to look at the door of salvation. <clears throat> we're going to say a few things about this. And, and, and this is, uh, some of this is doctrinal teaching, really, in a way. Uh, because there's a lot of folks that don't agree with what I'm going to be saying. Uh, they get this idea that you, to be saved, you, you trust Christ as your Savior, and then the next word that they add with that is plus this, that, or the other. But the very thing that God teaches us in His Scripture about this door of salvation contradicts that belief system of there's more to it that you have to do. In John chapter 10 and verse 1, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, please notice, it does not say a door. It says the door. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, if that was substituted with an A, that completely changes everything he said. But this says he's the door. That kind of tells me there's only one. What do you think? The door. Verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So what's Jesus going to do? I'm going to tell you what it means. That's what he's going to do. I'm going to tell you exactly what this means. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Right. Now, could that be any plainer? I am the door. I am the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. You understand why I call that the door of salvation? He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, that verse 10, you hear that verse a lot, but don't take it out of the context of this. The context is that Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the door. I'm the, I'm the only way to salvation. The thief is bringing all this other stuff it's wrong. It's misleading. It's deceptive. Right. I'm the only way. I'm the door. <coughs> In John chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. Singular. One person. Right. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus. Yeah. You believe in me. Right. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Oh, by the way, can I just throw in something right here? We don't need extra biblical revelation. No. Extra biblical revelation means that, that God all of a sudden gives something to somebody that's not in the Bible. And it's supposed to be on the same level. Jesus said, if it were so, I would have told you. Right. Right. Now, I've already given you everything you need to know. Right. I've told you the whole thing. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Who's doing it? He is. Why? Because he's the door of salvation. And if I go, that's a big word, isn't it? And if I go and prepare a place for you, that sounds like to me there's all of a sudden a choice in that thing. Now, did Jesus Christ pay for the sin of the whole world? The Bible says so. 
Is everybody going to be saved? No. But the Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish. And people will look at that and say, well, that means everybody's going to be saved. No. Don't say that. Not his will that any. But he's made us not predestinarians. We're not puppets on a string. We have a choice to make in this. Whosoever will, let him come. Now, does God work in that process of bringing us to him? Well, absolutely. Salvation's of the Lord. Salvation's not of man. But as he, as, he, as he draws us, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Don't you think every once in a while Jesus... Yeah. <laughs> a Haven't you been listening... I tell the story about that. First church I pastored, I, I was, I, 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 I like to study the Bible. I do Bible studies and, and series and that kind of thing. And I was doing it one in First Corinthians. <clears throat> and this fellow came up to me one night after the Wednesday night service. He said, you know, he said, I've learned so much about the Bible since you've been here. And I really appreciate you coming. He said, but you, I still don't believe I'm ever going to be spiritual enough to speak in tongues. Now, I had just gotten through teaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. And I'm, I'm, and I'm not a good actor. I'm standing there just shaking my head. Where have you been? What have you been listening to? All right. So he, after he's told them this, he said, all right, well, let me, let me just make it just as plain as I can. I am the way. I am the way the truth the li- and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right? Now, let's, ex- let's explain this door now. This is a very important thing. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, the Bible says this. Enter ye in at the straight gate. All right, now, everybody look back up here. Don't, don't look at that for just a minute. If I use the word straight to you, what's the first thing crosses your mind? Something without curves. That's not what that means. Not at all. Matter of fact, let me ask you a question. Was the path that led you to Jesus one without curves? Certainly wasn't me. Man, I had all kinds of twists and turns in my life. That's not what that said. It's S T R A I T. Now, we're going to see what that means. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. To understand the word straight. It means this. Straight means to be confined to a narrow space or passageway to be closed in on all sides. Uh, Years ago, we came up to visit my wife's sister and her husband. He He was a college professor at Bowling Green. And one day they took us to Mammoth Caves. Now, this has been a long time ago. And I enjoyed that very much. My, my, my daughter was very small. And by the time we were through with that tour, my wife was just wore out and my daughter was wore out. And if you've been there, I guess it's still that way now. They got that big old staircase that you have to come out from in that thing and keep on winding up and up and up and up. I was pulling my wife and holding my daughter, and I was just wore out because they were wore out, but I had to get them out of that cave. So we're going up those steps and going up those steps, and I sure was glad to see some light at the end of that thing, and then we got outside. But there's an area in that cave called Fat Man's Misery. Anybody ever been there? Okay. To go through that, 
you have to turn sideways and just kind of squeeze your way through that, that is a straight way. Yeah. It is so confined. Now get this, this is very, very important. There's no room for anything else. The straight door of salvation has no room for anything else but Jesus. If you start trying to add, well, you've got to do this. You've got to be baptized. You've got to do so many works of penance. You have to do... If you start adding that, it, it stops being a straight way. It becomes a broad way. But it's so straight. It's only straight. It's only wide enough for the door of Jesus Christ to be in that path. And the only way that we could ever be saved is to go through the door of salvation, the straight gate, the straight way that leads to forgiveness, that leads to uh, 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 regeneration, that leads to reconciliation, all of that. Only through that straight, narrow way. All roads don't lead to heaven. Right. <clears throat> I've used this uh, illustration uh, in the past. Kind of get this in your idea. In your head. Sin has separated man from God. Right. Okay? Think of sin as a wall that's been placed between you and God. The wall is too high for you to ever go over. It's too deep for you to ever go under. It's too wide for you to ever go around. And it's too thick for you to ever go through. So how is it possible for man to ever get to God? You ready? God put a door in the wall. And that door is Jesus. He didn't put an excavator out there to dig with. He didn't give you dynamite to blow the wall up. He didn't give you a ladder to try to climb over. He gave you a door. And in that door, we can go through that door and be saved. It's the door of salvation. I am the door for the sheep, Jesus said. The door of salvation, the only way for man to ever get to the Father. And listen, I, I believe, well, the Bible tells us on the day of, of Pentecost that 3,000 souls got saved. But listen to me. They went through that door one at a time. That God can save thousands of people at one time, but they're going through that door only one at a time, through that, right. through that door, which is Jesus, right. to get to the other side. Amen. And what's on the other side? Opportunity galore. Yeah. Boy, I, I, I thought I was going to you know, really be something when I was lost, and, and I thought that was a great opportunity. I uh, was just crazy. Yeah. I was just crazy. Yeah. And I found out when I... When I went through that straight door, that only way door, that God opened up other things. Yeah. We should shout from the rooftops that there's a door in the wall. Yeah. And grace and love put it there the for you and me. Yeah. The only way to God is through a narrow passageway through one door and one door only. So if you're trying any other way, the Bible says you're a thief and a robber. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Did you ever try to clean up your act before you got saved? I did. I, I was talking to Ray about it today. I said, that, that when, when I was lost, nobody had to convince me I was a sinner. I knew that full well. I, I, I didn't have to start at that point, I knew that. But I also knew that maybe there's some way I can fix this. And I tried. You know, I'm, I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And, and I found out that, that that same old sin was on the other side of the leaf. 
Good work. Only when the door was opened to me and I went through that door of Jesus did I ever get saved. Amen. That was it. Yeah. It's the only way for you. Right. Religion says otherwise. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm more interested in listening to God than I am religion. And God says He's the only door. Amen. And so He's the only way of salvation. All right, now. All right, you must go through this first door of salvation before any other of the three major doors of opportunity are going to be opened for you. Benefits and eternal blessings are only found on the inside of the door of salvation. Amen. When you go through it, oh, it's amazing what's there. Now, here's the second door. And, uh, oh, by the way, I'll just tell you about how I'm going to do this. I just stop at some point, and I just pick it up again next time, okay? Uh, there's no necessarily a stopping point, all right? Uh, it's already past 730, so whatever. Uh, the second door is the door of worship. In the book of Psalms, 84 and verse 10, the Bible says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand... I had, I had rather be a doorkeeper uh, in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, th this, is not, this is not really deep, but I mean, it makes perfectly good sense if you'll think about it. The only time that you need to have a doorkeeper is if you have a door. Doesn't that make sense? And so he's letting us know that there is a door at the house of God. We found out that it's not the same when you don't go through the door. Yeah, true. Amen. True. When all of a sudden, just a few years ago, yeah. all the doors seem to be shutting. Yeah. And you need to stay at home. Now, can you worship God at your house? The answer to that is yes. Can you worship God at your house like you can at the house of God? According to the scripture, you cannot. Because the door at the house of God, the purpose for that door, the reason God opens that door to those who have already gone through the door of salvation, by the way, you can't worship God and be lost. You can be religious, but you can't worship God and be lost. So when God opens the door of worship, it's at the house of God. Well, you know, I, 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 can, I can do just as well at home as I can here, not according to the Bible. When the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, what does that mean? I can do it just as well at home as I can here? No, absolutely not. You can worship anywhere. But the designated place of the house of God is different than any other place. Right. He said, I, I would just like to be just a doorkeeper. Yeah. Come on in. Right. It's open for you. Every service at this church that I've been here, I've heard this phrase. You ready to worship? Ready to worship? If we're ready to worship... We came through the door with only Him on our mind. We can't, we can't worship and, and we be in the forefront. Matter of fact, uh, I watch a lot of this stuff that goes on these days. And, and some people have been kind of surprised that I didn't go in that direction, knowing that my background and whatnot. I said, well, it looked like to me after you got saved, you just went straight in the direction of, you know, the contemporary, you know, aspect of things, you know. And, I mean, you'd be playing drums in some band somewhere in some church, and you'd be probably doing all that. And, 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 and no. Nah. No, I, I had sense enough to know that I worshiped me when I was playing drums. <laughs> I want to come to the house of God to worship God. Yeah. And it's got to be about Him. Yeah. Right. It's got to be about Him. Yes, sir. Look at what He's done for you. He put a door in the wall. Yeah. You say, well, I, I, I really don't know what to praise Him for tonight. He put a door in the wall. Yeah. 
and they let you go through it. I think that could keep us busy from now on. The door of worship. The Bible says in John 4, 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Him. A lot of this stuff that I see, and I, I you know, we'll just call it contemporary stuff. Uh, when, when I see that, it looks like to me they're worshiping them rather than worshiping Him. It's all about what it does for them. Well, I'll tell you, if you'll come in here and worship Him, it'll do something for you. But the purpose is not to do something for you. The purpose is to do something for Him. That's what worship is about. Isn't it something how narrow-minded God is? He says, it's my way or it's wrong. And so, it, I mean, you can categorize something and call it by something all you want to. You can call it worship if you like. But God looks at it and says, that's not me. That's not about me. That's about you. And so we get the, oppor- we get the opportunity. These are doors of opportunity. We get the opportunity once we've gone through that door of salvation. We can now worship God. We get to actually do what we were created to do. Isn't it something that, uh, uh, and we'll get to that created aspect for this is over with, but it, isn't it amazing? This is the way I, I, I see a lot of people doing things that, that just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> I'm going to go down to one of the car dealerships here in Florence. I'm going to buy a brand new car. And I'm going to park it in my yard. And I'm going to fill it full of dirt. And I'm going to plant flowers in it. I mean, isn't that why they made cars? To make flower pots out of them? No. Yeah, but God created us for His good pleasure. God created us to bring glory unto Him. God created us to worship Him. And what I see happening is a bunch of flower pots. Because it's about us. It's wrong. It's just wrong. Worship is about the Lord. Psalm 104. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. And into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. That means you've got to come through the door. <clears throat> Parking lot service ain't the same. I've already told you I didn't like school, so if I say ain't, just get it. You understand? It's not the same staying at home. Right. If you have to, that's a this, the different issue. Right. But there's an opportunity for a door of worship. Yeah. God opens it after He opens that door of salvation to you. Right. And He said, won't you come through this door? There are many benefits to the house of God. But the primary purpose is to be the place of divinely appointed worship. And it's different. It's interesting to me when it said, use that word in too. I had one of the ladies at my church when I was pastoring in Danville uh, in Providence she came up to me she was a school, uh, school teacher been teaching school for 40 some years <clears throat> she said you're the first preacher I've ever heard that could preach on one word for 45 minutes I preached on the word in two they found out in St. Lucia I can do the same thing on the word unto and we'll get to that before it's over 
into. Not the same as outside. Right. Right. Yeah. If I come to the front of this church and one of these, these dear men that stand back there, if one of them opens the door, I can stand right out there and not come in here. Right. Yeah. I'm not into. Right. I'm on the outside looking in. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be something if I came here tonight and, and they opened that door and I said, well, no, I'm going to stay out here. <clears throat> I just believe I can worship just as good out here as I can in there. I'd hope somebody that heard me say that would start to pray for me because I'm in a bad shape. Right. I'm in a bad shape. Yes, sir. Into. Are you getting into it? Good. Good. Into him. That's what worship is. Good. All right, now, let's add this to it, and we'll be done here in a minute or two. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 6, these are verses I know you're very familiar with, but I want, you to, I want you to look at something. Remember now, God does everything he does decently and in order. As you go through this door, then you go through this door, then you go through this door. All right, after you've gone through the door of salvation, you've been saved, then you have to go through the door of worship. If uh, one of my favorite phrases I've, I've used all through my ministry is you just can't put the cart before the horse. Right. That cart's not going to pull that horse. Right. That horse has to pull that cart. Right. And you have to get things in their proper order. God is a God of decency and in order. Right. All right, now, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. How was Isaiah able to do that? Because he was in two. Yeah. He'd gone through the door. God had opened this door for him to see something yeah. that most people can't see. And when he opened that door and Isaiah went through, and he said, Above it stood the seraphims, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried one unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. If the house was filled with smoke and Isaiah experienced the house being filled with smoke, Isaiah had to be in the house. Right. Yeah. Right. Isn't this a sad thing to hear? Boy, you should have been at church last night. I mean, it got thick. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll look at it on the internet. Not the same. Not the same. The whole house was filled with smoke. Then said I, and by the way, when that happens, it'll show us who we are. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's entered into worship. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon his mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. All right now, this, I understand the succession, the, the order of this thing. He went into the house of God. It was there that he was worshiping God. And in that worshiping God, God showed Isaiah who he was what his position, what his condition was before God. Right. And, and I've heard this phrase around here a lot too. And he got some help. Yeah. Yeah. Good. He got some help. Yeah. And after he got some help, yeah. Yeah. now listen, then there was another door open. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said, Here, here am I, send me. You see, until you go through the door of salvation, and until you go through the door of worship, you're not ready for the door of service. Yeah, right. Right. See, we... 
the, the, uh, the business-like model that drives a whole lot of churches is the idea we've got a plan, we've got a program, we've got this, we've got that. You line up with that, we'll accomplish something. The only problem with that is that's just not what God said. Right. He said, once you've gone through that door of salvation and you go through that door of worship, then you're ready to do something. See. But you have to be humbled first. Right. Well, I have to show you who you are. Yeah. And how does God do that? By showing you who He is. Yeah. And that's what He did here. Right. And so then it was time that they could go forward. The worshiping had to take place first. We're not able to worship unless we're first saved and we're not able to serve until we're first are saved and then are worshiping our God. Salvation without the door is nothing more than dead religion and now listen carefully. This might be a good place to stop. Service without the worship of God is an act of the flesh. And the Bible says, the flesh profiteth nothing. So you can't serve God in the flesh. You can't serve God in your intelligence. You can't serve God in your abilities. You have to serve God in spirit. You have to worship first before you can do what God wants you to do. Can I give you one more quick one? Not too bad. James chapter 4. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Now, does that, does that really describe contemporary worship? Contemporary worship is all about... Ah, you know. It says, worship of God, put it on your face, shows you who you are, so that you can be raised, so that He can lift you up so that He can send you out, so that He can do what needs to be done. And if we're not that way, we're double-minded. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Well, is worship for men or for God? Well, it's got to be for me. I'm, I'm doing it. No, no. You reap the benefit of doing it for God. But it's not for you, and it's not for me. <clears throat> if it's for men and God, now get this now, then you're double-minded. Yeah. Right. It's lost its meaning when it does that. Yeah. And much of what's categorized as worship today is all about the feel-good experience of men. That's man-centered. That's not God-centered. If that's the emphasis, then it's the man that's being worshipped instead of God. Right. You cannot enhance the worship experience by adding anything to it. Right. That's, what, that's what religion is so bad about. That's what the Pharisees did. Right. Pharisees took what God said and added to it. Right. Yeah. And, and if, you, if you'll just hit, use a little bit of common sense, why would we need to add to something that's perfect? Hey. Right. But that's what man does. I, I don't want to, you know, hurt your feelings or anything, but God's really not interested in your opinion right. or mine. Right. Right. And God really could care less about your two cents worth. Right. Right. He says, it's my way or it's wrong. Right. Right. And he said, I want you to go through this door of worship. And when we pass through the door of salvation and we pass through the door of worship, then there's another door that's waiting for us. Yes. And it's the door of fellowship. Yes. What an opportunity we have 
to fellowship with God. But you're not going to do it if you haven't gone through the door of salvation and you don't first go through the door of worship before you'll ever have fellowship. Let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the opportunity uh, or do you, you know, you know my heart. That this is such an, just an amazing privilege to me, and and thank you for the for the open door and for the opportunity. And Lord, I I, I pray that something, um, something been said that does help and 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 can and take us in the right direction, because we certainly need to go through the straight gate, and we need to enter into the door of the house of God with you on our mind and, 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 and worship uh, as, as only we really can worship the way you would have us to worship and Lord we thank you for the opportunity of fellowship and then the opportunity of service uh, Lord, Lord guide us through this and just open up your word to us and we'll thank you and praise you uh, for us in Christ's name we pray Amen if you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.